Should we touch on the fact that I sound terrible today, Matt? Let's touch on the fact that you sound terrible and Anna is missing. This was almost the opening debut of my solo, my one-man show. Your solo podcast career. (laughs) If Anna wasn't on vacation... Gallivanting. I wouldn't be here. I have COVID, okay? I got I got the Rona. I'm so mad about it. Ugh. You know, we've been so, so incredibly careful this entire pandemic. Just said no to everything. I feel like now is the time when all the careful people are getting it because the affordances that were during the pandemic now no longer exist. Yeah. Uh, there's literally zero mask mandates or anything in the UK. So, like... It sucks. It, like, we went from, like, that's okay, we can relax on the masks a little bit, to, like, oh, no, we're going to wear them 24-7. <laughs> oh. oh, that sucks, dude. When you started to say, I think I have COVID, it was about the time that Horizon Dawn Zero West, or, or whatever <laughs> it's called, came out. Yep. And I was like, yep. I was trying to put the two together. I was like, I wonder if he's just stuck on a bit and, and, and you know, <laughs> needs some, uh, need, need some PlayStation time. But, uh <sighs> No. And you know what? I don't even want to play it right now. Just, yeah, no energy to, to do anything. No. And like wearing masks for a long period of time. Every, I mean, ev- listen, anyone who's in any profession where they do have to wear a mask for long periods of time knows it hurts. Like my ears are killing me. I've always said like what I would quite like is a, a KN95 paper bag that I could just wear <laughs> over the entirety of my head. Yep. And like secure at the bottom. I feel like that would be socially more unacceptable, but probably more comfortable. Yeah, almost certainly. Don't try that at home, kids. No. Paper or plastic bags over the head. (laughs) (laughs) Not a good idea. All right, so let me tell you about some of the things that happened this week in security uh, with Watchtower Weekly. I don't know why I paused there, like there was going to be some sort of jingle. (laughs) Like, was I supposed to say something? I'm going to try not to talk a lot, okay? That was me waiting for the jingle, but I don't think we even have one in the real recording, let alone the the pre-record. So, Okta was the target of a lapsus breach. They've revealed the uh, full extent of it now, and it is reported basically all over the internet by The Verge and, and a bunch of others. But Okta's chief security officer has published an extensive update detailing the, the lapsus cyber attack. They're the ones, remember, who hacked all the famous names recently, and we've talked about a bunch on the show. So the cyber attack on the company, it affected about 2.5% of its customers, apparently. And so I've done a bit of digging and it works out to about 400-ish customers. The screenshots that were shared by Lapsus inside Okta's backend were taken from a support engineer's computer to which the threat actors gained access via the remote desktop protocol. So Okta confidently believes that its own systems were not actually breached as part of the attack. So David Bradbury, the the CSO, said the scenario here is similar to walking away from your computer at a coffee shop whereby a stranger has virtually, in this case, uh, sat down at your machine and is using the mouse and keyboard. So while the attacker never gained access to the Okta service via like an account takeover, a machine that was logged into Okta was compromised and they were able to obtain screenshots and, and control the machine through this session. Writing in its Telegram channel, The Lapsus Hacking Group claims to have had super user admin access to Okta's systems for two months and not just five days, uh, and that it had access to a thin client rather than a laptop, and claims that it also found Okta storing AWS keys in Slack channels. The group suggested it was using its access to zero in on Okta's customers. So yeah, I mean, the screenshot in the Telegram was basically trying to imply that it took those screenshots in January and that it's had access ever since. But Okta absolutely refute that and say basically the reason why this has come out a few months later was they've done all the right things in terms of their security and and the report, the independent report on this, has just taken a a couple of months to, to complete. So yeah, I mean, it's not a great one, but I feel like this is one where Okta seem to be on the right side of it, as long as the description that they're giving is is not too rosy and you know remains kind of truthful. The piece that really gives me pause in all of this was they claim that Okta was storing AWS keys in Slack channels. Like, no, Okta, give us a call. We can help. 
we can help secure your secrets. That's not where you put those things. Yeah, that does kind of terrify me. The screenshots of Okta's back end that have been flowing about seems like it backs up Okta's version of the story. That is like, essentially, this was someone who remotely just grabbed a desktop and took some screenshots and, you know, kind of compromised some things. Right. Yeah. I mean, as with anything, they've also said, you know, all the usual banter about that they'll improve their processes and, and such. So I'm hopeful that this doesn't happen to more kind of people and accounts inside Okta, but also similar companies to Okta as well. Like this is a security company. It needs the reputation. Something like this only hurts the entire industry. Yeah, for sure. This next one is a really interesting one. So ethical hackers prove that having a Mac doesn't make you immune to cyber attacks. This is basically stemmed, right? This thought that having a Mac makes you you know, immune to cyber attacks. I think this has basically come about by two things. One is that like antivirus is pretty good on the Mac and, you know, kind of built in and you don't really need to think about it. There's a lot more kind of security checks in place and it's created this kind of confidence in it, basically. And you don't see it in the news everywhere and all, all that kind of stuff. But a pair of security researchers have actually hacked a Mac belonging to billionaire film producer. Is he a billionaire now? <laughs> Jeffrey Katzenberg. Amazing. He's the Disney guy, right? Or, or DreamWorks. Something like that. <laughs> Dream, DreamWorks. DreamWorks SKG. <laughs> yes. Proving that owning a, a Mac device isn't an automatic defense against cyber threats. So Rachel Toback, a social engineer and CEO of Social Proof Security, successfully carried out an attack on an unspecified Mac device. According to Toback, the attack was demonstration for identity theft protection. The attack was a demonstration for identity theft protection firm Aura, a company that, that Katzenberg invests in. So Toback leveraged a since-patched vulnerability and social engineering skills to get Katzenberg to click on a phishing link spoofed on a website. Once Katzenberg did so, she was able to steal photos, emails, and contacts from the Mac. Additionally, the hacker was able to turn on the Mac's microphone and eavesdrop on Katzenberg without triggering the built-in macOS microphone indicator. That bit is terrifying in itself. Yep, I don't like that. So the exploit was built based on research from Brian Pickering, who became notable when he was paid $100,000 for discovering a Safari Universal cross-site scripting bug. More specifically, the exploit leveraged the underlying bug to carry out an attack using iCloud links and Safari's sharing preferences. Importantly, the attack only worked because Katzenberg's Mac was out of date by several updates. Uh. Oh, when you're worth a billion dollars, perhaps run some updates every now and then. Or, billion dollars, have someone do it for you. Just hire someone, an updates person. Please. So, Toback concluded that some mitigations for the specific attack include keeping machines patched with the latest security updates, using at least two methods of verification for communications, and avoiding on clicking suspicious email links, particularly if they are sent in an urgent manner. Oh, I've had a few of those. Like... <laughs> Why is it always I'm in a meeting or I'm in a meeting room and I need you urgently? Please click this link. Is anybody in a situation where that email actually happens in real life? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I, I mean, this is an interesting one because obviously that is quite a few vulnerabilities in, in one. And it's interesting that this was kind of part of a device that he owned. A pinch of salt with this, right? He's invested in a identity protection firm. And and just so happened to have a uh, Mac lying around that was uh, three updates behind. Uh, yeah. But I think this is a great bit of press for that company. Perhaps the identity protection firm kind of emails you when uh, you're a few updates out of, out of sync. <laughs> so moving on to kind of more important world events, Ukraine have recruited an IT army and are kind of directing those volunteers to hack Russian entities. This one is reported by Bleeping Computer. Ukraine is recruiting a volunteer IT army of security researchers and hackers to conduct cyber attacks on 31 Russian entities, including government agencies, critical infrastructure and banks. I'm just going to add in a disclaimer here. The target doesn't actually matter in a legal sense. The thing that this is asking people to do is a computer crime and you will likely be prosecuted for it. It yeah. doesn't matter that it is for some sort of cause or that you are doing stuff for another country. You are bound by the country that you are in and their laws. 
and most of the countries that they are asking for volunteers from, yeah, personally, I wouldn't sign up to this because it is breaking a law. There we go. There's my disclaimer. <laughs> so Ukraine's Minister for Digital Transformation announced that they need volunteer digital talents for an IT army to conduct operational tasks against Russia on the cyber front line. The number of new phrases that have come up in the past couple of years, that is the terrifying one, right? <laughs> Soon after a Telegram channel created to organize the IT Army's operations, then released a list of Russian targets. The list includes 31 targets, including the Russian government agencies, government IP addresses, government storage devices and mail servers, three banks, large corporations supporting critical infrastructure, and even the popular Russian search engine and email portex, portal Yandex. So the IT Army came soon after the Defense Ministry began to recruit Ukraine's underground hacking community to assist in these cyber attacks against Russia. This call to action was published through the founder of Cyber Unit Technologies, who then shared an application form on, on Facebook, etc. So Yushev, the Cyber Unit Technologies person, claimed that hackers worldwide have signed up to help Ukraine, even those from Russia. So recruitment of volunteer hackers and security researchers appears to be having some effect on targeted sites. The Kremlin, State Duma, and the Ministry of Defense websites have been offline in what appeared to be a denial of service attack. It seems to be kind of an attack back situation because I know some of Ukraine's internet services and all of those types of things have been hit as well. It's both kind of fascinating and upsetting and terrifying all at the same time to see this kind of front line in a war unfolding, right? Like I feel like this is the first the first time we've really seen it like this in a modern war. Yeah. That these cyber attacks and the, and the sort of the cyber warfare is taking a bit of a, a center stage in all of it in, in the conflict as well. Yeah. The other kind of fascinating point around this stuff is all of these, you know, Western services are now being taken offline for Russia and, and they're withholding signups and all of that kind of thing, mostly around both in, in unity with Ukraine and because that you can't accept payment from Russia anymore. And so Russia is spinning up basically clones of all of these types of websites, which has been interesting to see as they pull back from the world and, and start creating their own things. I mean, I think they're creating their own McDonald's now and just naming it something else. I heard a report, this is unsubstantiated, that the owner of the Burger King franchise in Russia was declining to shut down the franchise. They're like, no, no, I'm going to keep going because lots of people are coming now because they want to get burgers he just went rogue <laughs> yeah i mean if he can still make burgers out of something there you know mushed up newspapers or something if he's not getting his shipments through <laughs> so on, on to you know lighter subjects but also something that will likely affect everyone netflix is starting to test out a fee for customers who share their passwords for people outside their household so netflix wants you to stop sharing your password with friends basically and it's undertaking a new effort to try and stop you or at least I don't know, put you off, I guess. The streaming service will soon launch a test directed at cracking down on password sharing outside a user's household. Netflix says, we've always made it easy for people who live together to share their Netflix account with features like separate profiles and multiple streams in our standard and premium plans. While these have been hugely popular, they have also created some confusion about when and how Netflix can be shared. As a result, accounts are being shared between households impacting our ability to invest in great new TV and films for our members. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, the the <laughs> test will start in the next few weeks in three countries, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. The company will later evaluate whether to bring it to other markets. Through the test, Netflix will start letting standard and premium plan customers add accounts for up to two people that they don't live with for an extra monthly charge. These extra members will have their own profiles, personalized recommendations, and logins and passwords. So the, the fee equates to around $2.98 in, in Chile, $2.99 in Costa Rica, and $2.11 in Peru. So I imagine that to be about £10.99 in the UK, just how we're going now. <laughs> for Probably like nine bucks, something. Netflix prohibits password sharing in its terms and conditions, but it's been really lax with enforcing it over the years. In 2016, the company even said that it was fine with users sharing their passwords as long as they didn't sell them. In recent years, though, Netflix has taken greater action against the practice. Last year, the company tested a prompt on viewers using accounts owned by people outside their household. 
It reads, if you don't live with the owner of this account, you need your own account to keep watching. I imagine the button on that was okay. <laughs> just, yeah. just like okay. a dismiss. <laughs> They had a, a tweet that they had put out in 2017 that said uh, it was like on Valentine's Day. It said like true love is sharing your your Netflix password or something like that. Oof. <laughs> I, I mean, it does not age well. No, it's corporate 101 playbook, right? Like you you start as the underdog, you then get to be really big in the mass market, and then you try and make a little bit more money by just rinsing out little areas where you can. Yeah. So I imagine this happened in a meeting where someone was like, "We could get this much more money if we just did this." And, like, the sentiment of what they're doing isn't taken into account. Yeah. It's kind of funny to read all this, like, on the heels of... I'm pretty sure I just got an email saying that Netflix was going to increase my monthly cost, too, for my account. Mm. It's going up by a buck or something. Yeah, I think mine's going up by a decent amount. You know, a, a funny thing, both myself and Anna moved internet providers because we were being overcharged. Okay. And then our current internet provider put the price up by the exact amount that we were being overcharged by the other one. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I think uh, Netflix is going to see that people still somehow manage to do this. This is still going to happen. I'm not quite sure how they're doing it either. Do they count my next door neighbor? Are they doing it based on IP address? What happens when I change IP address and I want to log in from the same place? Like, how reliable do we think this is? This strikes me as the kind of thing that it, it's almost like anti-piracy steps that some software developers would put into their apps back in the day. When it's like, look, it is cheaper and easier just not to even acknowledge that the pirates exist. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, that's stop true. chasing this. It'll be fine. It's a never-ending battle. Just let it go. OK, mm. it'll be fine. L listen, make your official uh, stance and like policy that you can't share a password that will drive out all of the honest people. And then the, the people who are dishonest are going to keep doing it anyway, no matter what you do. So just let it go. Yeah, 100 percent. So you had an interview. And what I'm interested in is the difference in your voice in the segment that we're about to play compared to now. Oh, gosh, I know. Yeah, this is going to be two different people. This is, there's going to be a third person on the podcast in a moment. It's going to be me without COVID. Dropping by as our guest today is David Bader. David A. Bader is a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science and director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. He has quite the impressive CV, and I haven't even mentioned yet that David built the first ever Linux supercomputer or that he advises the White House most recently on the National Strategic Computing Initiative. David Bader, welcome to the show. Thanks, Drew. It's great to be here. I look forward to chatting with you. Can you give folks a little bit of background on your work and explain your current role? Sure. Currently, I'm a distinguished professor in the Department of Data Science at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. We just founded this department last fall, and I'm also the inaugural director of our Institute for Data Science. I joined NJIT in summer 2019 after serving as the founder and chair of the School of Computational Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. And I do a lot of research in high-performance data analytics, large-scale graph algorithms, and as it relates to problems in cybersecurity. That's really cool. That's a lot of stuff. When you talk about high-performance computing, like what does that mean exactly? Are we talking just server farms, quantum computers? What does this cover? Great question. So high-performance computing is usually when we use multiple processors, CPUs, accelerators, et cetera, together to solve a single problem. So often we're trying to either build our own machines by taking a whole bunch of servers and essentially tying them together with a network, or we may buy a quote-unquote big machine that has a lot of nodes inside of it and a high-speed interconnection network. And these high-performance computers often can tackle problems that are either too large for our laptops or problems where we need an answer much faster than what a laptop could tell us. So what sorts of activities are you engaging in in the cybersecurity realm with these high-performance computers? Often we're trying to analyze massive data sets. And these data sets may be terabytes or even tens of terabytes in size, and to analyze them on a laptop would just be infeasible. So we have a lot of programmers who use Python, NumPy, Pandas, and all their favorite toolkits. 
but they're at a loss on how to manage these large data sets. So we often build hardware software co-designed solutions, meaning high-performance computers, as well as the algorithms and software needed to analyze these types of data sets. So we both have a challenge of size. These are often tens of terabytes. And we often want the answers in near real time so that the analysts can get their results and understand, for instance, how an intrusion occurred, or what's the situation on my network, or how do I prevent one of these malicious attacks? Talk to me a little bit about some of the early projects that you were part of that were related to defense or or cybersecurity. Like, What problems were people trying to solve back then, and how have those problems evolved in the modern era? One of the areas that I pioneered over the last 20 plus years has been graph analytics. So using the abstraction of a graph for solving some of the most grand challenge problems facing our our nation, for instance, in areas such as cybersecurity and homeland defense. So to give you an example, many years ago, we worked on a project looking for insider threats within large organizations. So you could imagine that there are insiders, trusted insiders within your organization who may be trying to steal your source code, or they may be trying to take your customer list or up to some malicious action. And you want to be able to find these lone wolf actors. What we worked on under our DARPA project was taking all of the data of host-based monitoring of the workforce where individuals, employees would be sending emails, visiting web pages, having various logins, and trying to detect a change in their pattern of life in order to understand who may have been radicalized or who may have been up to some malicious intent, and to be able to detect it before something egregious happened. And to do this, we used large-scale graph algorithms. We built a graph out of the different objects that we were monitoring, people, places, and things. And then the edges represented relationships. For instance, if you opened a file, an edge would be created between you and that file and maybe the timestamp of when you opened it. And through this information, we were able to run analytics and be able to understand what were the most sensitive actions happening and take a CISO who may be overwhelmed with false positives. You may get a 1,000 or 10,000 false positive hits a day as your workforce maybe clumsily clicks on links on web pages they shouldn't or accidentally opens a file. But we reduced that 10,000 to maybe the three best security alarms that the CISO should have a look at that may be the ones that are going to be ones that add up to an employee who could be headed down some malicious path. And so that was done with graph analytics. And it's kind of the hallmark of our problem of trying to solve real world grand challenges using these types of data structures. As you look back on the history of computing since you've sort of gotten started to today, are there any particular milestones that you remember that changed the game a little bit that unlocked capabilities that previously had just not existed or or created new opportunities that just weren't there before? Back in 2006, I was selected to direct the Sony Toshiba IBM Center of Competence for the Cell Broadband Engine Processor. Now, this may not sound like much to our listeners here, but that's the chip that was inside the Sony PlayStation 3. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this. I can't believe you're going to talk about the PS3. This is awesome. Right. (laughs) Please continue. And I had a very early action to come up with software that could be accelerated on that chip. This was really exciting to repurpose a game chip for solving problems in high-performance computing and cybersecurity. That chip was then used in 2009 for the world's first petaflop supercomputer. This is a highly capable machine, in fact, the fastest machine in the world in 2009, that sat at Los Alamos National Laboratory and accelerated an IBM system with AMD processors 
with this unreal acceleration by a game chip in the PS3. So I'm really proud to have had a part in that. And I think it was really game changing to be able to use commodity technologies such as game chips for accelerating the most capable machines in the world. In fact, following on that, we saw NVIDIA that used to create graphics processors and still does GPUs repurpose those GPUs for high-performance computing as well. And today, nearly every supercomputer in the world is accelerated with NVIDIA GPUs. This is revolutionary on understanding how to accelerate performance using commodity processors, which is a theme throughout my career as I built the first commodity processor-based supercomputer using the Linux operating system. I remember this. I've been a huge Sony PlayStation fan for a long time. And I remember, like, this was in the news of, like, oh, look, like, the government built a supercomputer cluster using PS3s because Sony enabled you to install, you could uninstall the main operating system on the PS3 and install Linux instead. And there's photos. I mean, you, you can search it right now, PS3 supercomputer, literally racks of PS3s all interconnected doing crazy amounts of processing because the, the cell processor was bananas at the time. Like it was very powerful. That's, I didn't realize that was you. Oh my God, this is awesome. That was me. And in fact, the, the Sony PlayStation 3 was a capable box. You didn't have to uninstall your games. You could install a second operating system and dual boot your PS3, which was an incredible revolution. So we work very closely with, with Sony on that. And we also work with IBM that designed the processor and Toshiba that also had a partnership in order to create that most capable processor of its day. And the machine you talk about, Racked Up PS3s, is likely the one that Dr. Rich Lindemann was running at Rome Air Force Base, where he hooked together, I believe, 512 PS3s <laughs> to create a supercomputer out of them. What a, a fantastic system. Gosh, that's so cool. Okay, let's bring this back to cybersecurity a little bit here. You've worked on a number of DARPA-funded programs with companies like IBM and NVIDIA, as, as you've mentioned. Is there one in particular that you think had the biggest impact on cybersecurity? That's right. I've worked on several DARPA projects as a lead scientist. And one of them that I think has had a tremendous impact on cybersecurity was in the DARPA Atoms program. Atoms was anomaly detection at multiple scale. And this was the project that I've referred to briefly earlier, where we're looking at insider threats within large organizations. This was a program that was stood up to respond to some occurrences at the time. For instance, Major Nidal Hassan was an army psychologist who was stationed at Fort Hood and came onto base and killed a number of people there after he was radicalized. Or Chelsea Manning, who was the alleged source for WikiLeaks, who was also a cleared army private who was releasing information from the government. In both of these cases, you had people who understood the organization, were explicitly aware of being monitored, knew all of the safeguards and all of the security of the organization, and yet egregious events happened. And what we did was we worked with a number of partners to come up with a graph analytic solution that would be able to detect these threats before an egregious event happened. These lone wolf attacks are sometimes the hardest threats to find within an organization and we're very proud that we were able to make an impact into this problem. Wow, that's incredible. How? Maybe that's too big of a question to ask, but like... This is where the power of graph analytics really comes to play. Often when we're in an organization, as the employees go along their normal workday, they may click on a link that takes them to a corporate page that says that page is blocked or they may accidentally open a file that they shouldn't have and a note will pop up and they'll close it. And all of these are warnings that will go to a security officer in charge of monitoring these for threats. 
And these become overwhelming. Imagine your company has 60,000 employees, 100,000 people, et cetera. It's nearly impossible to check out all of these and understand how you're going to look at individuals to see who may be a real threat. What we did was use the power of graphs to amplify the signals that were occurring. So rather than looking at single events, we started to look at the combination of events around individuals. We tried to understand if there was collusion between individuals within a company and really get more situational awareness by building a big graph that represented the people, files, the rooms that they may sit in, the web pages they may click on, the emails that they may send to others, and really get a handle on the digital situational awareness within that organization so that we could tell whether or not an action was a single anomaly or whether an action appeared to be in a set of actions that raised the suspicion level. That way, the security officer, rather than being overwhelmed with 100,000 alerts in a day, may get three to five alerts for individuals that are the ones that they should really start their investigation on for that day. And not only alerting as to who the people are, but the system would provide the rationale as to why the system believed that that person may be an emerging threat. So graph algorithms really give us that capability to provide the explanation along with the recommendations. I mean, David, it sounds like you're describing the plot of Minority Report here. (laughs) You are days away from standing up the future crime division here. (laughs) So I've heard that, but there's a big difference. And in Minority Report, individuals were investigated essentially without their knowledge. The systems that we created require the individuals to agree to be monitored. And they typically agree whether they're in the government and every time they log on to a system or in the workplace and the policy set uh, at their workplace. We relied on that because we really needed the full information of an individual. And that gave us a lot more power rather than if this was running in the wild where the system would not be able to detect these threats so readily. So there was a big difference between this work and Minority Report. Yeah, yeah. So David, I think, you know, on this show, obviously we've covered over the years since we've been running, we certainly talk a lot about password security and and being wary of phishing attacks. Is there an area of personal security that you don't think gets enough attention or doesn't get talked about enough when we're talking about keeping one's oneself safe online. That's right. Often we hear about common areas such as protecting our passwords and using strong passwords, maybe using a password keeper. We often hear about learning more about phishing attacks and being very wise about email that comes in with suspicious links with file attachments that we're not expecting. But one thing that isn't talked about as much is our data security and our our data privacy as well, which I think is really another area of cybersecurity that we all have to be familiar with because our data is really the crown jewels of everything that we do. And someone that can access our data or even modify our data has an advantage over us. So I want to recommend that our listeners are as careful with their data as they are with their passwords and with their systems in general. So that means, for instance, keeping data at rest encrypted with strong passwords, making sure that you're protecting your data when it's on cloud-based storage, and making sure that it's not openly or publicly available. And also making sure that you are able to understand if your data has been manipulated without your knowledge. For instance, using hash checks and other types of mechanisms that will detect a change within your data sets. So these are areas that we have to be more proactive about and and more vigilant to because more and more our data is going to be 
uh, attacked in ways that really are going to be quite astonishing to see. And bridging on that, we've seen supply chain attacks, for instance, of our software supply chain, where we've seen the attacks on our networks and our devices based early on the supply chain of software that has wormed its way through many systems and got the biggest of vendors and governments. So we really need to be more careful about our our data sets and, again, to not trust the system that they're on, understand that maybe every system out there is compromised, and thus, how do we make sure that our data remains safe? Okay, so sort of playing off of that, perhaps, what's the piece of advice you would give to security professionals and how they can stay ahead of the curve these days? Rue, one area that has really caused concern is these supply chain vulnerabilities. For instance, we all use a lot of open source software, for instance, packages that we get on GitHub within our development for both our internal projects and also external projects. And while we take individual packages and scan them for security vulnerabilities, we've been less capable of doing that across the open source software supply chain. I think more diligence has to be played for looking at vulnerabilities that occur across reused source code, for instance, within open source projects, and also the code that goes into everything that we design as it moves up the supply chain. So rather than looking at just one package we're writing, we have to understand how that package interacts with other packages and how it's inserted into, for instance, everything from network drivers to compilers to web browsers and our applications and so on. This is really going to be one place where security professionals have to be more aware of these new types of threats that are emerging on the landscape. David, we have covered a wide range of topics today, early Sony PlayStations up through supply chain attacks. Where can folks go to find out more about you and your current work? My website is davidbader.net. And there you can find all of my papers and some of the current projects that I'm working on, and also some links to GitHub where you'll see some of the open source projects that we've developed and continue to develop. For instance, Arcuda that I mentioned earlier. I am a distinguished professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology where myself and my fantastic group of students continues to do a lot of work in graph analytics and high-performance data analytics and designing our next generation of supercomputers. Fantastic. David, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming by. Ruth, thanks a lot. Great to talk with you and hope your listeners enjoyed this podcast. All right, so I don't know how your brain is functioning right now, but it is time for Ridiculous Requirements. Good. I need something. I need something positive. Welcome to Ridiculous Requirements, the game where we work together, aka it's just Rue on his own this time, uh, (laughs) to come up with passwords, not advised, that fit the honestly terrible requirements that we create. So this is the random but memorable meta edition. So, (laughs) oh my god. No. Anna has done this for us. And I don't think that she's left the answer. So we really are working together. Oh, no. This episode uh, might leave on a cliffhanger uh, where we don't get the answer right. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. So the requirements must contain the last name of the only guest who has appeared on the podcast three times. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Must contain the third word. From the title of our first episode, oh. must contain the name of the bot often fought in Play Your Passwords Right, must contain the final word in Rue's favorite podcast phrase. I can't even remember that one. Must end with the year we released our first episode. Oh, that was probably the 90s. It feels like we've been there so long. <laughs> All passwords must end with the same letter. All right. So must contain the last name of the only guest who is a Appeared on the podcast three times. It's it's Sarah, right? Ooh. Are we classing Sarah as a guest? 
I guess we do. Yes, absolutely. Anybody who's not a host. The only other one I was thinking was uh, Troy Hunt. He's been on it three times, right? Uh, has he now? Okay. Must contain the third word from the title of our first episode. I, I looked it up. <laughs> I looked. Oh, it was definitely correct battery horse staple. Uh, pilot. Correct battery horse pilot. Oh, okay. But you had it. Go. You had a horse. Good job. Must contain the name of the bot often fought in play your passwords right so that was lower bot that's weird okay yeah wasn't it or higher bot um oh dear all, all passwords must start with the same letter <laughs> what okay yeah 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 hang on so it's it, it it's hunt horse higher oh higher yeah okay and then must contain the final word in rue's favorite podcast phrase drop it in here okay must end with the year we released our first episode. Well, let me go back to my podcast feed that I was just looking at. Yeah, 2018. Oof, that was a different world. Yeah. Okay. I think we did it. See? We did it. Hunt, horse, hire, here, 2018. <laughs> the, the name of my autobiography. Oh, gosh. If you had, like, a choice and you had to write an autobiography about your career at 1Password and, and in general your life, would you call it? drop that in here we'll just drop that in here i think that could be a contender for a title yeah 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 i think mine would be like my random life or life but random something like that oh yeah i could see that not so memorable maybe that <laughs> all right with that God. i'm gonna let you go back to bed yeah please and finish a couple more levels off of uh, horizon zero dawn i'm not playing any <laughs> video games i'm quarantining i always glamorize being sick with playing video games but when i'm actually sick that's the last thing that i want to do <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right love you rue feel better soon love you matt thanks bye, bye. <laughs>